we bring in a friend who we've known for years and years and years. He's an author, relationship therapist, Dr. R.G. Allen Wilson. Some expert advice on how we can all talk to them. Joining us now is relationship expert, Dr. R.G. Allen Wilson. She's the author of Courageous Conversations Connect. Good morning, R.G. Doctor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, Janelle. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. And as we mentioned, a lot of people just dealing with anxiety during all of this. What are your suggestions? Some of the things that we need to remember is that this is temporary. This is temporary inconvenience for long-term gain. And as long as we stay healthy, Janelle, then everything else is recoverable. Talk to your children about what's happening right now. What are the best yeah. best ways to do that? There's some do's and don'ts, right? So you want to tell them that you're going to be here. You, we're going to be okay. Kids want to know that you're they're secure and they're safe. So predictability, structure, and consistency. You also want to let them know you have a plan. And even if you don't have a plan, tell them that you're working on one. Hey, guys. Oh, my goodness. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to our first masterclass, right? We've been wanting to do this for a really, really long time. And it's now here. I am Dr. R.G. Uh, Dr. R.G. Allen Wilson. I am the founder and CEO of Faith Inc. That stands for Family and Individual Therapeutic Healing and co-founder and CEO of Connections Matter LLC. Here, what we believe is that we believe in healing relationships one courageous conversation at a time. And we believe in healing families, right? And this is our goal. So we, Morgan and I, my husband, and I, I got to give a big shout out to him because without him, none of this would be happening. Uh, he's doing all the behind the scenes work. Uh, he and uh, one of our um, wonderful, wonderful persons that works with us behind the scenes with our digital marketing, Daryl Montague, and also uh, my cousin, Brent Marsh, who works with us on marketing. So I want to give a shout out to all of them working behind the scenes. And of course, I, I, just none of this would be happening without Morgan E. Wilson Jr., my husband, uh, who does all the work behind the scenes. So we thought when this whole quarantine situation happened that we would begin to uh, talk about this because it was challenging for so many people and it was challenging for us. And we were thinking, well, we get the benefit of working from home and yet other people don't. And there's so many people on the front lines and there are people that are impacted and affected by this disease, um, COVID-19. And so we started doing quarantine talks. Well, here was the deal that we would do it at 10 o'clock and we continue to do it every day, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. But there were a lot of parents that are homeschooling their children now and they're also working from home so they could not join in. Uh, there were other people that weren't able to, to join in at 10 o'clock. And we thought, well, hey, you know what? They're not getting the same information that everybody else is getting. So why not do a master class for two hours where we come together, our crew, we call it our crew, Connecting Relationships for Epic Wins. And we talk about these issues. You're going to talk with me. We're going to talk with each other. We're going to talk with people within our crew. And we're going to kind of figure this thing out because there's so many issues going on with this quarantine situation. Uh, and the, you know, it's, it's not coming to an end anytime soon. So since we are here together, we, we might as well learn something together. Uh, and so I say, let's get into it. Let's get into our quarantine talks. And I thank you guys for joining me. I thank you for tuning in. Um, this is the first of uh, many masterclasses. As I was digging into the work that that, uh, that was the preparation for this masterclass, what I realized was there's work to be done in, in terms of grief. We're gonna tap into some of those issues, uh, but we're gonna also create additional masterclasses so that we can go further and deeper into the conversation. So I want you guys to uh, give me some thumbs up. I want you to give me some smiley faces. I also want you to give me questions that you, um, that you're thinking about as we're delving into this conversation. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Share, tag, like, do your own watch parties. Uh, we've got this new technology. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, my cousin Brent Marsh, who uh, turned us on to this new technology that allows us to streamline both on Facebook 
and on YouTube. So I hope that some of you are watching on our YouTube page, the Ask Dr. RG YouTube page. We're also streaming on IG. And so I'm hoping that you all are being able to join in the conversation. So uh, let's get to it. Let's move into the, the conversation. Hmm? Oh. oh, we are going to have a station break. So this is new to me all. We're going to have a little bit of a station break before we get into it. And we are going to, um, we, we've got sponsors. Goodness gracious, Morgan has been working hard. So we have, we have sponsors. So we're going to, as soon as we uh, hear a little bit of a message from our sponsors, then we'll come right back. So stay with us and we'll get right to it. <laughs> Hey guys, we're back. How'd you like that sponsorship? Uh, we are now about to move into our, our uh, process for, for this evening, our masterclass. So here's some objectives. I always believe in letting you guys know what the objectives are going to be. And so we're gonna focus on reducing anxiety and fear because a lot of people are fearful, uh, understandably so. Uh, this is scary, right? This thing is very, very scary. We're going to learn how to adapt to our new norms. That's really, really important because none of us have been here before. Uh, Autumn's on. Hey, she says, hey, Dr. RG, I'm a young adult minister. And what advice would you have for leaders who deal with young people and who feel overwhelmed in anxiety with anxiety? That's awesome. We're going to handle that for sure, Autumn. So thank you for signing on. China's on. Thank you, China. Gloria's on. Thank you for signing on to this first masterclass. So we're going to cover reducing anxiety. We're going to cover um, adapting to our new norms, resetting our mindset. OK, <laughs> how many of us need that like yesterday to reset our mindset? Because all of this has been thrown on us and we've had to calibrate, recalibrate and over and over and over again. And then identify grief and loss. That's the one I said that we're probably going to do a whole serious on grief and loss because it's bigger than what we can cover tonight. Uh, but we will cover some issues around grief and loss and then managing our emotions and our stress level. Oh my goodness. The stress level is on fleek these days for most of us that are dealing with all of these new norms and new information and the information changes from one day to the next day. And so we're going to talk about that and how to manage those emotions and then enhancing our communication skills with our loved ones. And then we're going to learn how to grow through this crisis better than before with elevated relationship skills. So here's our first question. And I want to make sure that I know I let people know who's on if I can get down there. OK, so here's the first question, guys. Where were you and what were you doing B.C.? BC stands for before COVID-19 pandemic. Where were you? Where do you? What were you doing? How were you functioning? What were you, who were you hanging out with? So I've got some interesting pictures that I put, put up. This is, this is uh, my church home, Enon Tabernacle Baptist Church. That's my pastor behind the pulpit and it's the church and we were full. I can remember the date that Morgan and I were at church and it was probably the beginning of March when we really didn't know what was going on. And so were you at your faith-based organization? Were you at church? Where were you? Or were you at a football game? Y'all know that the Eagles won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Not so much this year. Uh, so I kind of tuned out, but look at all those people. I just kind of wanted you all to think about where you were, were you at a football game? Were you at church? Were you at Howard's homecoming? This was, I think, 2018. If you see the guy in the in the uh, in the uh, orange sweatsuit, that's Kanye West, uh, and Kanye was there doing a church service or something. But 
you know, every single year I go to my homecoming. Many of you go to homecoming, whatever school you went to. And look at all of those people. Look at all of those people together. That's that's kind of what we were doing. Or maybe you were on the beach. I know Morgan and I were in Boca visiting our uh, family, uh, Jean Austin Jefferson and Velva Lily Jefferson from Billy. We were there and we were on the beach and that was in January. So these are the things that we were doing and we were doing it with each other. I don't know about you, but I haven't, I didn't hear anything about social distancing back in January. I really didn't even think of the terminology. I didn't know anything about PPEs. I didn't know anything about social distancing. I never even thought about a pandemic and that we would be in the middle of a pandemic, right? And for many of you who go to work every day, right? Maybe you were at work. Maybe you were in a cubicle. Maybe you were like this crew of people that were working on, on a project. Hey, Gail, good evening. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, Gail says I was at uh, making a funeral arrangements for my father who died March 8th. And prayers go out to you, Gail, in reference to your father who passed away. God bless him. God bless him and rest his soul. So she was making funeral arrangements. We all probably know where we were. Larissa's on. Hey, Larissa, thanks for joining. I uh, can't see everybody for some reason. Oh, I know what I have to do. Hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to move it up. Okay. Good afternoon. Good evening, Larissa. So, so these, these are the places that we were. Okay. So fast forward question for you. Where are you now? And what does life look like for you in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic? Hey, China, China says she was out of town and preparing to fly back home. Yes, so mo many of us were flying, right? Many of us were, you know, just hanging out with people. So in the middle of this pandemic, this is what has happened. That we are, I think in Pennsylvania, we are four weeks into a quarantine and the, in other states, they're about five weeks into quarantine. So look at this picture. Dad is homeschooling, he's, he's working probably doing his job on his computer and his kids are on the floor and he's watching them very tentatively and very attentive to his children. Mom is on a chair doing her work and her kids are doing their work. So think about that. Many of us have been catapulted into working from home and actually having to deal with our children as well. Or this is an issue that many people will have had loved ones in nursing homes and they're used to going to visit them and they can't now, or they go visit them and try to talk to them through the window. There's also people who are now quarantined at home alone and having to deal with being home alone, right? Uh, and trying to figure out, well, how do I engage with people if they're telling me that I need to be socially distant, right? Or physically distant. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like in terms of social distancing, not meaning social isolation. What if you are a doctor or a nurse or a medical professional? Did you ever imagine that you'd be in this predicament where you'd be fearful of helping the very people that you vowed to take care of because you don't know whether or not you're going to take this virus home to your family or I never really thought about a bus driver being, this woman is a bus driver and she's got a mask on. I never really thought about all of us wearing masks, did you? Uh, or that, you know, a bus driver or a truck driver, a uh, pharmacy worker or a grocery store worker, did you ever think that they were first responders, that they were on the front lines? Well, now they are. And guess what? Many people have been having cocktail parties or, you know, FaceTiming or doing Zoom just to stay connected because we're all. So in this picture, I have people that probably are from all over the country, even the world, and they're trying to find ways to connect. Why? Because we are in our own homes. Many of us trying to pay attention to the rules, trying to make sure that we're healthy, but also trying to protect other people. Because now what we're told is that we could be a carrier, right? And be asymptomatic and not know that we're carrying this virus. And so we're trying to make sure that we are home uh, and we are safe and we're keeping other people safe. So we're connecting. We're trying to connect that way. 
This is the other thing that we're going to talk about towards the end of this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about what happens when you had some issues in your relationship, you didn't address them, and now you're quarantined together. Now, for those people who, let's say, they don't really have any issues, great. That means that they get more time to spend together. But for people that have been married for a long time or they've been together for a long time, guess what? Most people have some issues that they need to work out. And sometimes people think that they have plenty of time and now they're quarantined together and trying to figure out how do I level up on my communication in order to stay in this quarantine and come out of it better, not bitter. All right. So the next question and Gloria says, let me see. Oh, let me go over here. I'm sorry. I got I'm This is new to work in this thing. Uh, Gail said, thanks for your condolences. And Gloria said, postal workers are not even being, can't get all the way up there for some reason. Show, no, it says hi. I'm sorry, Gloria. You're gonna, um, it says postal workers are not even being recognized. I think, I can't, I can't. Can you tell me? Oh, thank you. But I can't see the bottom of it. And they should be. I do, but it's it's cut off at the bottom for some reason. Now I see it. When Velva jumped on, then I saw it because it popped up. Yeah. Um, so postal workers should be. And shout out, you know, um, I want to give homage, and we do have sponsors, but I want to give homage to all of those frontline workers, the postal workers, and that where we get our mail, and the flight attendants, and the gate agents and the truck drivers and the farmers, quite frankly, that are putting their lives in harm's way, uh, um, the grocery store workers, uh, those doctors and those nurses, and even people working in the hospital and administration like my sister, all of those persons are heroes and sheroes that are putting their their lives on the front line um, in jeopardy to, to protect us so that we get to stay home. And so they should be recognized and they should be safe. So they should have what they need in order to do their job. And so I wanna, um, I wanna make sure that we give homage to those, those persons that are right now probably putting themselves in harm's way for us. I also wanna make sure that we uh, give homage to those persons who have either lost their lives uh, to uh, this dreaded virus and those persons who, have, uh, who are sick in the hospital now. The more and more we're saying, hey, Jean and Bell, and Satrina's on. Hi, G Satrina. Thank you for joining. Gail says, "I've been, uh, I've been where I am now. I am providing online therapy for the population of young students who now are able to continue the training due to the vi virus. Uh, I provide therapy for them. And over the past month, I've developed an online therapy program for consultants and mental health workers, as well dr as drug and alcohol workers. So, uh, awesome. So." That's and we're going to get into that in terms of what people can actually do, because we all have a way of contributing to this virus and this pandemic. And so Dr. Gail is saying that she's doing online work and that she's continuing to work and, and provide those services. So that's really, really, really important. Uh, again, homage to those persons who uh, have either lost their lives or lost their family members. It's very, very serious because we are having to recalibrate our whole entire lives now because of this pandemic. Uh, and we've got we gotta try to figure it out. So the next question for you guys, now that we're here, because we are here, what do we do with this big fat mess brought on by COVID-19? What do we do, right? We're all trying to figure this out together. There's some things. So I wanna start off by saying, that I do think that we need to cut ourselves some slack, right? There's, and I like acronyms, we've never been here before. None of us has ever been here, unless you're 102. There may be a few people. I think I did see somebody on Facebook that was celebrating their 105th birthday. So that person, shout out to them, I should remember their name, uh, because they were here during the Spanish flu. But everybody else, we don't know what it's like to experience a pandemic. So we're kind of, flying the plane and building it at the same time. And so there's a couple things that I think that quite frankly, we need to figure out how to do. One is show up. The question I'm asking 
all of us to think about is how are we showing up? Are you able to show up in your home for your kids or for your partner or for yourself or for your parents? How are you showing up? And are you showing up in a way that allows you to give up your resources? What are the skills that you actually have? Have you thought about what can I do for someone else? When they started talking about these masks, I saw a lot of people making masks. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh my, God. my goodness. There we go. I gotta move it over here. I saw a lot of people making masks and that's because that's what they could do. I was trying to think about what, what could we do and what we could do is because I do, like Gail, as a clinician, I help people every day. I have an online practice as well, but I also felt like there's something else that I could do for the larger collective, which is why we came up with Quarantine Talks and why we came up with doing this free masterclass. The other piece is that a lot of times when we think about slack and cutting ourselves some slack, I think we don't realize the skills that we actually have as leaders. You don't have to, I mean, it's great. We need leadership at the larger macro level. We absolutely do. But how many of you all have thought about the fact that leadership is not just at the higher levels of government. There's leadership in your own home. There's leadership in your own relationships. There are leadership in your own, there's leadership in your own, let's say church community. What are things that, what are the things that you're doing to take on a leadership position? Have you decided that you're gonna call the seniors in your church community or your faith-based community? Are you reaching out to someone who maybe has kids and says, you know, well, hey, I can go to the grocery store for you while I'm going to the grocery store for myself and just drop them off. Hey, Donna, Donna's on. Thanks for joining the show, Donna. Um, you know, what can you do? Leadership is important. And then acknowledge. Acknowledgement is important. Why? Because as we're thinking about this pandemic, as we're thinking about what we're going through, as we're thinking about the pain that we're all experiencing, we need to acknowledge, we need to go on and acknowledge that this is hard. And that's gonna get us to start talking about what we're learning in this process. And then commit. Are you committed? Yes, babe. So his ID is on the um, oh, yeah. video. I just yeah. wanted to share a couple of questions to you about throwing that idea. Um, Karen Woodson, Karen Woodson, children and youth social workers are still investigating child abuse cases. Mm. That's from Karen Woodson. Mm -hmm. Um, your sister, right, your baby sister. Oh, Kelly's on? Yeah, she said, we need to have patience with ourselves and patience with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just see some other questions. Marston says, neither are the UPS workers. Mm -hmm. Oh, the UPS workers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 UPS workers need to be, uh, shout get, you know, shouted out. And they also, we need to pay homage to them for being frontline workers out there, giving, you know, delivering uh, all of the art, the things that we need. Uh, Allison is on. She's uh, one of our faves. Mm -hmm. Kids good evening. Kids good love. Right. So, mm -hmm. I, so I do some love. And also, mm -hmm. um, December baby seven says we are building the bridge as we cross it. Oh, yeah. We absolutely are building the bridge as we cross it. And we need to be stronger together. So thank you, IG family, for joining. Thank you, my baby sister, Kelly, for, for joining as well. Uh, this is our first master class, and we're all doing this together. We are building the bridge as we're crossing it. We're flying the plane as we're building it. We're doing all of it. Velva Lily says the phone contact with some of the senior members at the church um, in which they are grateful to laugh and share talks in other other than virus, the virus. So, so that's what Velva is doing. And that's what we all can do. You know, share a phone contact and talk to people if we have a little bit of time on our hands. Dawn is on. Thanks, Dawn, for joining uh, this first master class as well. So we were back. Let's get back to Slack, right? Slack. We've got a little bit more time before we get into our next break. Slack, show up, show your leadership in whatever way you can. Acknowledgement, acknowledge that this is really, really hard. And so therefore we have to cut our, each other a little bit of a break when we're trying to figure this thing out, whether it's in your own home or whether it's in, you know, a bigger, larger community. And then we have to commit. How about we commit for the long haul? Because the truth is, this really is a marathon. It's not a sprint. We are in this for the long haul. And it doesn't look like, the, even the, if they allow us to come out of quarantine, we're still going to have to abide by some social distancing, distancing rules of engagement in order for us all to be safe. So that takes me to my last letter, K, the last letter of slack, K, kind. 
ask yourself, are you kind? Ask yourself, was the statement that you made to your partner or to your kids or to yourself even, are you being kind? We need kindness more than we've ever needed it before. My mother used to say, it's nice to see it be important, but it's more important to be nice. Are you being kind to yourself and to others? This is really, really, really important, guys, because when we think about cutting ourselves some slack, we move into a healthier place in an atmosphere, the atmosphere that we are in, whether we're home, working from home, or whether we're there with our kids. So that moves us into what are we doing and how do we do it? It's not too late to have what I'm calling a smart plan. Why is it a smart plan? Well, I think because everything is a smart thing these days. It's a smart refrigerator. It's a smartphone. So why not a smart plan? Think about what it means to be smart, because there are a lot of people that are not making good, smart decisions these days, right? They're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. They're focusing on the wrong thing. They're focusing on maybe that the fact that they can't get out of the house. But smart decisions are specific and significant where you're able to stretch yourself, right? And then M stands for, can you measure the decisions that you're making with your plan of action? That's what POA stands for. Is it meaningful? Is it motivational? Can everybody in the household agree to the SMART plan? I see this a lot in my practice, that families are not agreeing. So now you've got the teenagers or the young adults wanting to get out of the house because it's been four weeks. You've got mom and dad arguing with each other. Nobody's on one accord. Your SMART plan has to be a plan where everybody agrees, where everyone achieves something, and where it's action-oriented. And then the R is realistic. Realistic, reasonable, and results-oriented. Think about it. When you grow through the, this pandemic, as we're growing through it together, when we get to the other side, Lord willing, I said early on the, in the beginning of this process, I said, most important thing is that we have to be here, right? If you're here and you're safe and you're healthy and your family is safe and healthy, then we want to stay that way. And then everything else is recoverable. So now you can double down on this plan. Is it re a realistic plan? And you can tweak it along the way, by the, by the way, guys. Tweak it if it's not working. But is it reasonable? Is it results oriented? And then finally, is it time based? What does the plan look like with regards to time management? Do the kids have a different plan than you? in terms of your schedule? Is it tangible, right? Is it, that's realistic. Like, can you, can you measure the tangi tangibility of the plan? And can you track it so that you know how far you've gone and how far you've grown, quite frankly, at the end of this journey? Next, I've been saying to everyone that we need to have an SSR. So it's not too late to do your SSR. What is an SSR? Safety care plan, self-care plan, relational care plan. The SSR is extremely important because when we don't plan to fail, they we fail to plan. That's really at the end of the day, right? And so I've heard from many of my clients that they are feeling a little lethargic. They're feeling a little not, not motivated. They sort of took this as a break, but then once they got the break, then they didn't really know how to recalibrate and get back on track. And by the way, when this is all over, you're going to have to move forward, right? So think about your safety care plan. The safety care plan is, and I know many of you have probably already done this, but you can share this with others. What are your household essentials? If you're quarantined, you need to eat, right? And you shouldn't have to go to the grocery store every day unless you have no other choice. What is the food supply? Do you have that food supply in the house, right? Medication, what do you have medi the medications that you need? A lot of times what people were doing is they were trying to get at least a 90 say, day supply of medication if they're on a lot of medication. That's what I did for my father so that I would have those medications available to him if I could not get over there or if he became sick. Also make sure that in that medication that you have a list of it so that if your loved one has to go to the hospital and you can't be there, that they have a list of what medications that they're already on. The other piece is that if you, if you plan, then what I did was got those containers and my father's medication is planned out for a full month. So he doesn't have to even think about it, it's there. Share resources. We've learned, I've learned so many things from my clients about, Netflix, especially for my teenagers, Netflix party 
and Google Duo so that you can communicate with your loved one if they're on a different phone platform, like uh, either uh, iPhone and Android, if you will. There's a lot of information out there and we need to be sharing it with each other. And of course we know, this is how we're communicating now, the internet connection. So share your information. And quite frankly, we're on now, share this with other people. Let them know that we're on. Let them know that they can join if they so choose. This is our first masterclass in terms of mastery. Think about what masterclass is. It's mastering a skill. We're in class trying to learn how to master the skill of how to survive in the midst of a pandemic, right? How do we survive so that we come out the other end thriving? Think about also your safety care plan when you're talking about caregiving. Uh, I was watching Chris Cuomo the other day and now his wife is sick. She was the one that was taking care of him. Now the kids are taking care of both of them. Well, what happens? Morgan and I have talked about this. If one of us were to get sick, the other person would have to do the same things that we've talked about in order to make sure that that other person is cared for and vice versa. So who's doing, gonna do the caregiving? Or if your parents or your loved one lives in a different household, how will you care for them? How will you maintain physical distance and social distance at the same time and still get their needs met? And then identifying spaces for quarantine within the quarantine. I think that's very um, difficult, quite frankly, to identify the quarantine within the quarantine. So people either are in the basement or they're in the bedroom or wherever they are. And then transportation, of course, how people are gonna get to where they have gotta go. So I think we're gonna transition there the safety plan, when we come back, we're going to talk about the self-care plan and the relational care plan. But right now, we're gonna stop for a moment for our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Awesome. That would be awesome. Uh, so I'm asking uh, just for everybody to know. So we're all on the same page. We are we are streaming from Facebook and from YouTube. And I'm asking all the IG people to go on over to the YouTube so that they can get the same experience as everybody else because they don't necessarily have they're not being able to see the, the screenshot of the, the information. So I'll see you guys over YouTube. It's under Ask Dr. RG, A-S-K-D-R-A-R-G-I-E. All right, so let's get going. As, uh, what does Chris Cuomo say? I like what he says, let's get after it, right? That's what he says. Uh, so I don't know, I have to find my own thing to say. I can't be barring Chris Cuomo's state statements. But self-care plan, this is very, very important. And so you guys tell me, I wanna hear if you all have created your own self-care plans already. Velva, uh, Dawn is on, China's on, Gloria is on, uh, on the masterclass. Tell me guys, if you've created your self-care plan, this self-care plan is extremely important. In fact, excuse me, this week I have a, um, you know, this week we have a goal setting uh, program where every week I set my goals and then I get an accountability partner. And so this week was spiritual elevation. And so I wanted to go deeper in my prayer life and my meditation and some of my scriptures and have some quiet time. And so I had access to Calm and I hadn't been using it and I started using it uh, for my breathing exercises and I actually love it. So think about what's connected in terms of your self-care plan. Mind, body, and spirit. Mindfulness is extremely important. Why? Because oftentimes we tend to think about what we haven't done in the past and what we have done in the future or what we what we haven't yet done in the future. And it's very, very difficult for us to stay in the present. And what mindfulness does, it's, it really helps you to center your energy. And it helps to reduce a lot of that anxiety that many of us have about what's going on in the world right now, what's going on in our home lives right now, what's going on in our communities right now. It's, it's a really very difficult 
to manage all of it. And so I'm encouraging people in terms of their self-care plan to find some kind of mindfulness. It doesn't have to be an app if you if you find it too expensive, but I find the Calm app is really good. Inscape is really good. There's also Headspace uh, that a client of mine is utilizing. Uh, you can also just go on YouTube and click on mindfulness med or meditation uh, and look, look at, see what works for you. Mindfulness, meditation, uh, mindfulness keeps you centered, but meditation resets your mindset. It gives you intentions. Uh, my sister Kelly, if she's still on, she sets her intentions for the day. And I think she's the one that uses Inscape. Uh, Kelly, if you're still on, let me know how that's working for you. But really setting your intentions that you're going to have a good day, that in spite of it all, that you're still here, that you're still breathing, that, you know, God worked you up. There are wonderful ways that we can recenter our energy in order in order to set our intentions and then movement. Everybody's got to move. Right. you got to figure out ways to move as a part of your self-care plan, uh, along with having meaningful engagement, whatever that looks like for you guys. Meaningful engagement looks different for all of us. So it could be calling your friend, it could be texting, it could be doing face chat, it could be doing Zoom, but we do, or it could be whomever is in your house. Quite frankly, I think that this is an opportunity for many of us to double down on getting to know the people that we live with. How many of us, quite frankly, are guilty of spending a lot of time externally, outside of our home, at work, Think about it. None of us has ever been here before in this respect, that we are quarantined 24 seven with the people we live with or living alone with ourselves. And that does not um, sort of register for us, or at least I think for many people, it didn't register for quite a long time. Uh, and, you know, now we're having, having to recalibrate, try to figure out, well, now I've got to reconnect with the person that I've spent the majority of my time with my coworkers, not necessarily my loved ones. So figuring out how to re-engage with the people that you love, getting to know them, getting to know yourself, asking them about what their hopes, wishes, and dreams are. You know, what is it that they want to do in the midst of this pandemic, but what do they want to do after it? And then the last thing is music. I think music is very, very key. Right, because uh, I know D Nice and some of the other DJs came on. Anthony Hamilton, uh, uh, Kim, they've been doing their free concerts. And I even saw something Morgan sent me uh, regarding uh, Jennifer Hudson. So music can be soothing and calming to the spirit when we're anxious. And that is a very, very important part of our self care plan. So create a quarantine routine. Think about that quarantine routine. What is your schedule? Do you have a wake up time? This is for your kids and this is for you as well. Do you have a wake up time for the week? Many people who, if they furloughed, they're furloughed or they're not working, they're using this time to sleep in a little bit later, what, what have you, because they don't really have to get up. But I do think it's important to set your wake up time so that you can begin to integrate some of the things that you want to do. Maybe there are things that you haven't had time to do that you can integrate. Maybe there are things that you've thought, Hey, I used to do this and I don't do this anymore, but set your work time or your school time for yourself and your kids. Integrate meal, meal uh, times and stay hydrated, guys. This is very, very, very important to stay hydrated, uh, especially when it comes to this disease, because what they're saying is that it attacks the immune system, right? So you got to keep your H2O, keep, keep your water, have your meals, integrate break times. That is something I'm very, very guilty of sometimes working all the way through and not integrating break times. As a matter of fact, I was talking to my neighbor, Kat, last week, and she was saying that working from home, she realized she looked up and it was eight o'clock and she hadn't left her work desk. And so integrating the break times and the end times are very, very important so that you are doing the natural things that you would normally do if you were going outside of a home at the same time, also integrating that for your children as well. Creative time is very, very important. Uh, uh, Bilal Kayoun, a very good friend of Morgan and I, he's started to write now. He's writing a book and he's also doing artwork. Uh, um, he's painting again. What is creative about you? Everybody has some creative skills. Recreational time, exercise time, free time, family time, friend time, all that is important and then rest time. That is extremely important so that you rejuvenate 
and re revitalized before you lay it down. Once you lay it down, it's now time to like recalibrate for the next day. Gail says, yes, getting in touch with one's emotions and feelings at the moment is, uh, is meaningful. Uh, it helps us to cope and understand where we are in the moment. We can attend to the stress and anxiety where we are. Absolutely, Gail. Uh, Harold's on. Hey, Harold, thanks for joining this, our first masterclass. So now that we've got all that straight, right, there's a relational care plan. Okay, think about this for a relational care plan. Many of my college students were at college and now they're at home with their parents. This is the last place that they want to be. So I've been having them to think about, well, who do you want to connect with? If you want to connect with your family, do that maybe in, on the weekends or in the evenings, but also tap into your social media platforms to connect with your friends that are now home with their families as well. You've got to have family meetings on a regular basis because the information, guys, is changing on a regular basis every day, several times a day. You got to manage that, right? But you do need to have some family meetings so that you can talk about what are going to be your new norms, how is everybody doing, have an open forum where people can talk about what they're feeling, and then have some fun time, have some fellowship time, some friend time, some food time. People gather over food and we're used to going to, right, right about now it's gonna be a holiday, we are used to having a picnic or a cookout. I've been saying to people like, have a picnic at home. I think that Sheila was saying that she and her husband do that as well. So think about the creative things that you can do to spend good relational time, both with your family and your friends. That's extremely important. So now that we've got that out of the way, the next question is, how do we adapt to our new norm with this extended quarantine due to COVID-19? How are you guys adapting to your new norm? because I think that people were all on board for a while. Uh, Satrina Boyce said, I'm trying not to snack along, <laughs> along with the kids. I appreciate that. I'm trying not to snack along with me. <laughs> and um, it's kind of hard. Angelique is on, I've come to enjoy appreciating um, time with my kid, preparing her meals, seeing her have fun during the day and spending time with her in the evening. Our relationship is so um, much less strained. I can't see the bottom part of that. I see it, but I, what it, the, my bar, because I am here all day, I think I see. It. So, because I'm here all day. Oh, I see it's on that stream. It's really, really tiny. Yeah, it's really, really tiny. Um, so, thank you, Angelique, for that. Uh, spending time with our kids, and you know, it's really interesting. We gotten to this place where we, the norm was not spending time with our kids. The norm was not spending time with our spouse. Hey, Sheila, I just was talking about you. I talked you up. Thanks for joining. I was telling, and I can't see the bottom of it. It says absolutely something. Sit Booker? Tonight's Sit Booker. Sit Booker. Oh, okay, okay. So are you having a shrimp? Are you having a picnic though? Because you said that you had a you you and I, Larry have a picnic, Sheila. Um, so I just talked you up about that. The norm, you know, many of us, the old norm doesn't work. It was adaptive for then but everything is different with regards to this, this new norm that we're trying to establish. So how are we adapting? I can tell you that what I've been hearing a lot is people saying, I'm over it. <laughs> like I'm over the pandemic, I'm over this COVID virus, this COVID-19, I'm over PPEs, I'm over, I'm over all of that. And most people are just wanting to like break out. Here's the problem with that. They're saying, that there could be a second or a third wave, right? So it would be horrible to have done all of this work to keep you and your family safe and then get tired of it because it's hard and then go out, get yourself or someone else sick. And what's worse, they don't live. You know, so we really have to think about what this is a temporary inconvenience for long-term gain, but the gain is we live. The gain is we win. The gain is that we have the victory. The gain is that we live to tell about it afterwards and that we learn a whole lot about ourselves along the way. Uh, so what's your new norm? And how are you adapting to the new norm? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, guys. Here we go. So dealing with anxiety and adapting to the new norm, there's a couple things that I think people need to do. 
Uh, okay. Before, uh, as Sheila says, intentionally, oh, intentionally getting dressed, using the, the fine china because it is so special. I think picnic date. And Donna says, I'm actually enjoying the quietness. Oh, that's nice. I'm telling you, like, you know, I don't, the quietness is, is a, at a premium these days, especially, I guess, if you're home with your kids, you might not have as much quiet time. And then uh, Satina says, my husband and I uh, take walks in the morning before he heads to the hospital to work. Uh, I can't see the bottom of it. No one is out and it's peaceful. Okay. The bar is kind of messing that up. That's awesome. Um, and God bless your husband for he has, if he's working in the hospital and then he's on the front lines too. So, you know, this has caused us to really think about what's really important. Um, the pettiness, the things that we thought were so important before all of this. Now we're finding more and more of our loved ones are either sick or passing away or somebody that we know. Um, I think on a week, in, in one week, I've gotten a call that um, there's several people, either my clients uh, or uh, people that we know whose parents have passed away. And so I count it a blessing that we're still here. At the same time, I know this is really, really, really hard. It's really, really hard. Karen's on. Hey, Doc, she said, the other Wilsons, Glenn and Karen. Thank you for joining, Karen, and, and your husband, um, Minister Wilson. Um, I love you two guys as, as a couple, you guys, um, you know, support me all the time, and I so appreciate it. Uh, so let's think about this. Adapting to our new norms. Focus on accepting the new norm. How do we accept something that we don't want to accept? That's really, really hard, right? Most of us are like, ah, this is, I'm over it, I'm in denial. But once you get to a place where you accept it, then you can make the mental adjustment. You can reset your mindset. Well, a lot of that is your attitude, right? It's that you begin to adapt new skill sets. How many of you have learned something in the last four weeks since you've been home that you either thought you knew, but you didn't know that, that you knew it as well as you did? I know that I'm doing a lot of things that I didn't know. Like I'm learning technology. Now, Sheila's gonna laugh at this. I've always been challenged with technology. And our very good friend who's passed away, Nakia used to take me to the phone store when I used to have the little razor, or I used to have the, the Blackberry, and she would help me with technology. But now I'm learning between Morgan and I, and he's teaching me a lot and other people how to do it, the DIY, do it yourself. Sheila says it's stressful masks and gloves all day as an essential worker. So coming to coming home is a quiet place and it's a blessing. Absolutely. It is stressful. Um, and when we see those masks, that it, it reminds us that we're still in the middle of it. And we, it also reminds us that it's not over. Um, I do think the other thing that's stressful, Sheila, though, is seeing, uh, seeing people that don't have masks on, right, that don't seem to be taking this seriously because I think that they are the ones that could potentially be big carriers of this virus and pass it on to their relatives or their loved ones, uh, whoever they live with. So um, it's something to be thinking, thinking about. We are asked to quarantine or unless you are an essential worker so that we can help, right? Not hurt. It's so that we can help others be safe along with ourselves. Thinking about adapting, new skill set new strategies. It helps us to appreciate the progress that we've made. How many of you, I'd love to hear, can appreciate or have an appreciation of the progress you've made? Where were you on day one? I know for me, I was like, oh my goodness, this, this is happening. What are we going to do? Morgan and I were talking about getting our supplies. So I feel like that the calm part of me has gotten to the place where I now have adapted to my new norm and I have a routine. I have a ritual. I've appreciated the progress that both of us have made. We actually, you know, the, the running joke is that I send myself to the room. I send myself to my room or to my office when I feel like either I'm being agitated or, uh, or uh, I'm being at an adjutant. And I just kind of separate myself to get myself, you know, a little bit of breather. I call it a timeout so that we're not saying and doing things to harm each other and that we're doing things to help each other. And of course, acknowledgement of our new attitude. That's really, really key. Because when we think about our attitude, our, that's 
the part that keeps us going. So next question, how do you deal with increasing fear and anxiety due to the constantly changing information and the uncertainty of COVID? So how have you guys been dealing with it? Because if you're watching too much TV, I can tell you that your anxiety is probably on fleek right now, right? Because it's not only that the information is changing, but it's also the realization that we didn't have all the information to begin with and subsequently could have possibly put ourselves in harm's way because we didn't have our information. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining the, uh, the for our first masterclass. He says, we are making adjustments to our budget that will help us even after this is over. That's awesome. That's awesome because we want to be better when this is over. You know, there's a there's an opportunity here. Oh boy, wait a minute. What did I do here? Oh, okay. Gotta flip back and forth. Okay, I'm sorry. Babe. Yes, babe. Hmm. Oh, Gloria. Gloria says, uh, it is so stressful when you're judged for not wearing a mask when no one knows whether we have access to a mask and how hard it is to get them right now. That's a very good point, Gloria. That is a very good point. Uh, I do think that there's a lot. So, so this is about sharing information. And we did. that's what I meant when in the very beginning when I said we need to cut each other some slack, right? We don't know what people's situations are. We don't know if people, I think I heard Dr. Burke say that she uh, was saying, don't go to the grocery store this week. This is going to be the peak, right? But how did it, doesn't she know that people don't, they have to get the groceries when they have money. So in reference to Gloria's statement, a lot of times we do find ourselves being judgmental of each other. And we don't know what people's situations are uh, as far as masks are concerned. What I do know though, is that there are a lot of people making masks online. You can go online if you do have access. I, in fact, my neighbor sent me a link to making masks with a t-shirt without even sewing with as long as you have a t-shirt and you have scissors, you could actually make a mask. So there's some things that we can do to still protect ourselves. And we just have to kind of level up. We have to even ask ourselves, are we making the right decisions? Because every decision could be literally a matter of life or death. Autumn is on, hey Autumn, it says the stillness and the slowness can be really peaceful. Awesome, yeah, it can be, it can be. And Daryl's on, hey Daryl, thanks for joining. Hopefully I can get this up. I can't see it. Mm. No, I can't see it. What Daryl? Oh, Daryl, I did. Me too, Daryl. Me too. I in the very beginning had it in the background, and then I found myself being somewhat hypocritical because I was saying don't watch it all day, but I would have it in the background. So now I literally turn it off and I listen to calming music. So those are things that that we can all do very differently. So, all right, ways to reduce anxiety. This is really, really important, guys. Uh, hey, Angela, thanks for joining. Anxiety escalates due to worry about uncertainty and unknown outcomes. That's how our anxiety starts elevating. And so I want you guys to think about your focus, right? What can you control and what can you not control? Focus on the controllables. That's the most important thing. A lot of times we're focused so much on what we can't control and we're spending a whole lot of energy on things that we can't control. Yes, babe. Okay. Oh, and Sheila says, I reduced how much time I spend on spend Zooming. I'm sorry, what? It's so tiny. Oh, Angela said, I stopped watching TV. Morgan was trying to show it to me, but it's so, oh, I see it at the top, but um, it's, it's so tiny in the screen, so I can't see it. Sorry about that. This is a new platform, so put, bear with us, guys. Um, I will, we'll get better at that. Um, and then Gail says, Porchilla? I see, I've reduced, I don't see a question. I see Sheila says, I, I reduced? Statement, okay, yeah, I see it. I reduced how much time I spend Zooming. She said, oh, and I watched news briefings and more time with God, prayer and journaling. The pandemic project is what I call it. Awesome, that's awesome. 
And uh, Gail says, I focus on being aware of new information, form reliable re resources, and try to get off track. Um, and not try not to get off track, focusing on self-protection and to protect others in, in the same way. Cleaning up my contain containment surfaces and um, uh, I, if I'm all overwhelmed with information. All right, so focus, organize, change, utilize, and stay, right? Focus on what you can control, organize your space. I think that's very, very essential. I wasn't quite ready when I realized I was gonna be working from home the whole time. And so organizing space is essential in order for us to create a space that allows us to be focused. Changing our expectations, uh, changing your expectations based on what's doable and realistic, right? Sometimes our expectations are just not realistic. You know, if you're gonna be in the house with a whole bunch of your kids and your spouse, maybe your parents, to expect that the house is gonna be completely clean probably is not so realistic. So we've gotta change our expectations in order to deal with this new norm. And then utilize internal and external resources. There's resources all over the place. Sometimes all we need to do is ask or just go online and see what is available to us. And then finally stay in the present as much as possible. That goes back, guys, to the mindfulness. If we allow our minds to go to the what ifs and the what it could should us, what we didn't do in the past, what we haven't done yet, all of that is going to make our anxiety go through the roof. So stay in the present. Additional ways to reduce your anxiety in your household, and this is for people who are in the household in some ways with multiple people, Establish your routine. We've already talked about that. Avoid obsessing over the endless coverage. We've talked about that. Organize your workspaces and create new quarantine rituals. Do you guys, you know, have some games at home or do you have a ritual that you would like to implement for your family? Does people, do, you know, I've worked with families where nobody eats dinner. I don't know what, what, where, what happened to us that no one eats dinner together anymore. But that could be a reinstituted ritual that at least you eat dinner at the same table so that that's a time for you to actually talk about the day. And then, of course, you know, I'm going to say if you're having real difficulty, telehealth like Dr. Gail's on. There's multiple other people that are on that are mental health professionals. People are actually doing a lot of telehealth online and it's working. It's working. You can be safe in your own home. You can sign on to your doctor, whether it be your medical doctor or your mental health professional, and get what you need and not cause anybody else to be unsafe and not cause yourself to be unsafe. And then, how do we reset our mindset in order to better manage our anxiety? You want to say something more? Gloria, uh, close your door. Yeah, this bar at the bottom is covering it up, so I can't see it. So close your door, Gloria says. Thank you, Gloria. And we're going to go back to, so this whole reset your mindset. Well, think about the resetting of our mindset. Well, why is that so important? Well, because a lot of times it's about our attitude. So in the midst of a crisis, oftentimes people are acting as if it is a crisis because it is. It's new. They don't know what to do. They haven't been here before. And our mind has everything to do with how we manage difficult situations. Uh, Angelique says, if God gives us new miracles every day, we should certainly do that for ourselves. Uh, and every day is new. I love that. I love that. So here are the things that I think will help us to reset our mindset. Reframe our thoughts from I or we're stuck in the house to we're safe in the house. It's just a reframe. Oftentimes our thoughts will get the best of us. I do a lot of thought substitution with our my clients and I ask them to think about the negative thoughts, write down the list of the negative thoughts and then write down the positive thoughts. Once you make, write down the positive thoughts, then take them and put them on a little sticky or three by three by five card and utilize them as your anchor for the day. Rechannel your energy to positive thoughts like, you know, um, you, you now have time to focus on your home, your family, yourself. Um, you set the tone for the atmosphere in the household. And remember, we went back to being the leader. 
This is the way in which you can lead within your own household as opposed to having those negative thoughts. Redirecting your energy and intention from the external to the internal, reminding yourself of what you have to do versus what or what you do have versus what you don't have. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how you recalibrate, how you push the reset button. So we're going to take a quick break with uh, our sponsors and we will be right back. Growing a business can be overwhelming. However, it doesn't have to be difficult. With the right resources, task becomes easier and the rewards are great. Easy Make Systems makes online marketing and business management less confusing and more affordable. We've placed all the necessary components to make your job easier. Our Easy Make Website Builder gives you the ability to create stunning websites or landing pages. Utilize our Easy Make Social to stay current with social media and our Easy Make Mail to drive more engagement through emails. How about creating 24-7 customer service with our EasyMake bots to be there whenever your customer needs to reach you? And more importantly, you can access all of our software on an easy-to-use dashboard that gives easy access from one location. EasyMake Systems is your single source solution. All right. Hey, guys. So thank you for staying with us. And uh, that was a little commercial from the our sponsor, which is Daryl Montague with Easy Make, who makes a lot of this. And we just couldn't do without them, quite frankly. And so you should definitely check them out. Um, by the way, guys, if you can do watch parties and give us some thumbs up, some smiley faces, some hearts, that helps with our algorithms. Let other people know that we're on this platform and that we are a lot of likes. Give us likes. Uh, that definitely helps with the algorithms. And share, share, share. That helps us to continue to do this work that, that we want to do and that we feel is our, our calling, quite frankly, Morgan and I. And so we appreciate you staying with us and we appreciate you engaging in this conversation. So we were at resetting the button. Reset your button, right? What does that look like, pressing the reset button? It looks like recalibrating. Uh, I, I love the word recalibrating because it means that, it doesn't mean that you, you start from square one. It doesn't mean that the past is not relevant. It just means that you make, you're making a decision to then double down on saying, okay, I can do this differently. I've got now four weeks in, I've got some information about what we've done well, what we haven't done so well, what we, you know, the thing, mistakes that we've made, and I can recalibrate. I can then begin to reposition myself in a place with this quarantine where I can begin to take advantage of all of the things that we're, that I'm learning. Um, reorganize. I, I don't know about y'all, but I've definitely had to reorganize some things because when you're moving and shaking and you're working on the outside of the house, then when you come back into the inside of the house, you're, you're not really sure where anything is. And so reorganizing can be really, really, really helpful. Um, repurposing, the repurpose of what it is that your intention is um, can be helpful. And then re-envisioning. Once you re-envision, what is your life going to be like after this? Then you can begin the restoration work to reconnect and let's see, reconnect. Angelique says, um, I said, I read that. If God gives us new mercies, that one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it's too small to read. It's too small. Okay. Okay. Somebody's got error messages. So we're going to go to the next question. How do we mitigate the overwhelming fear of un the unknown? All right. So you guys have heard me say this some before. I really believe that fear wins. And uh, my good friend, Jean Jefferson, Jean Austin Jefferson says fear and faith do not reside in the same space, right? And so we need to double down on our faith. But I also recognize that sometimes we get overwhelmed by our fear and fear escalates um, due to our belief that someone or something is likely to be dangerous or threatening to us uh, or that it's going to be painful. Certainly this pandemic and this virus um, can make many of us feel extremely fearful, right? Uh, and, but I learned this a long time ago that fear often says means forget everything and run. Oftentimes the fear wins if we forget everything that we've learned. The fear wins if we forget how, who 
is in charge, right? Um, but the fear wins if we forget who our source is. The fear wins if we forget that we're resilient and that we're, we're a powerful people. The fear wins if we forget all of those things and we just kind of run away and we get paralyzed. But the fear loses when we face everything and remain. Really, we, we face whatever this challenge is. We say, we're going to do it. We, we're going to double down and we're going to win. We know that we have the victory. Many of us who are believers just, you know, you know, uh, completed our, 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 our celebration of, of Jesus Christ rising and, and being here. And we double down on understanding that, that we win because, you know, he died for us, for us to have the victory. And so that helps us. And whatever your source is, understand that fear, you can either use it to hurt you. It can be very hurtful and you can be paralyzed by it, or you can use it to say something's up and I'm going to double down on trying to figure that out. So here's some ways to reduce your fear. Maintain calm through daily prayer or mantra. When I do the quarantine talks, I say the serenity prayer. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change the courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. I love that mantra because sometimes the energy that we're expending trying to change things that we have no control over. How many of y'all were trying to change people by getting them to stay in when they didn't want to stay in or getting them to wear a mask when they didn't want to wear a mask or getting them to get some, you know, wash their hands, whatever it is that we've had to learn over the last four weeks. Sometimes we can't get people to do what we want them to do or most times, quite frankly, uh, and oftentimes we have to just kind of sit with our own level of calm, if you will. Hold on a second. Uh, I only see Gloria. Oh, love, um, love you, sis. Time for quality time. That was Sheila. You're putting, I can't see it. It's, it's, I can't see it. Hmm. We should never forget. Gloria? Oh, so now I see she says, um, Gloria says, I have an error message, and then we should never forget. It's at the bottom. I see your name. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got you. Got you. Okay. It is very small. I got you. Okay. Um, okay, so calm, maintain calm, stay connected to positive people. I think that's extremely important, guys. You know, social distancing does not mean social isolation. Uh, social, it doesn't mean emotional, psychological, relational, or spiritual isolation. So we got to stay connected to the people that really help us to stay on board, on, focused on the positive, not the negative. Decrease our stress levels. Okay, so the thing about decreasing stress levels is that we have to do our breathing, right? Breathing is essential. And that's why we do it early in the morning, at, you know, at our 10 o'clock quarantine talk, because a lot of people that are having this virus, they can't breathe. Uh, they, they don't have the oxygen and the, the bandwidth to be able to breathe. Meditation, mindfulness, yoga, yoga, journaling, all those things can help. And guess what else can help? Having a little sense of humor. I know that some of my students on my, that, I, that I see for therapy, They'll send me my, um, memes that, you know, they see on maybe TikTok. I know there's a lot of people doing TikTok these days. I said I was going to even try it, uh, if you will. So sometimes just that lightening things, the levity uh, can be really helpful. And then the other things that you can do is practice the attitude of gratitude. How many of you all know that the attitude of gratitude can get you to the other side? Doing a journal, writing a journal, uh, Sheila's on. I know that years ago when we were um, facilitators for SAS, Sister Waller, our, our first lady, came in and taught us how to do a prayer journal. Uh, you know, and so that's a wonderful way of being prayerful about what you're grateful for. If you're even on this platform and you're listening to this masterclass, think about the gratefulness of being able to be in a home somewhere have Wi-Fi and be able to connect in that way while we're in the middle of a pandemic. Also learning something new, taking up a hobby, uh, you know, figuring out what you can do. I'm going to take up gardening. I love gardening. I haven't done it in a long time. And that's what I'm going to do. 
uh, during this period of time. Uh, Autumn says the relief of embracing his um, his the is calm. Him is calm. Provided, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this. The relief that embracing his the calm is the calm provided is that the fact that it provides very little room for fear take away. Okay, I think the wording of the autumn, the way that you said that, it was hard to read it, but I get the I get the sense of it that it's calming to to connect with a source. I think that's what you were trying to say, and I appreciate your comments. Also, think about. Uh, and Envy, hey, Envy's on. Envy said, write five things I'm grateful for every night before I go to sleep. It's been um, and something, something practice. It's been a practice, um, which is all, oh, an extraordinary practice. Thank you, Envy. Yes, writing five things that we're grateful for every single day. Because listen, it doesn't have to go this way. I, you know, it, it, being here, being well, not having this virus, all of us ought to be grateful for that. If we wake up in the morning, we need to be grateful for that. Also learning something new, rediscovering old, new and old parts of the self during reflection time. I had a friend that called it purposeful pause. Like the, what, the time frame that we're in right now is a purposeful pause. Think about it, guys. Everybody is really moving super fast these days before this quarantine. And it, in some ways, it slowed us down so that we could really focus on um, ourselves. Now, the thing about it is most people, the introverts, don't have a problem with this. The extroverts are chomping at the bit to get out. And I think that maybe there's something to be said for the introverts that they we could learn, because I'm a little bit of both, uh, but I think I may be more of an introvert. People would be surprised to know that. Um, I really haven't had a lot of problems with being in the house and I've been pretty busy. But I also think that there's something to be um, explored about the parts of us that we struggle with. So for those extroverts who are struggling with leaving, you know, not leaving the house, we need to explore that and vice versa. And then building up our immune system. This is really key, guys, to fight the fear, right? And when I say building up your immunity to fight fear, I'm talking about physically, nutritionally, mentally, relationally, familiarly, and spiritually, right? So what does that look like physically? Your fruit, we all know this stuff, fruits and vegetables, hydration, right? Um, your superfoods, whatever those superfoods are for, for you, whatever you can eat, everybody's diet is a little bit different, but physically building yourself up because this virus is capitalizing on people who have compromised immune systems, whether they're older or whether they're younger, whether they're obese, whether they're, you know, whether they have some hypertension, those issues. And they've just started talking about the fact that it's impacting black and brown people more than our uh, white brothers and sisters. And, and why is that? In many ways, sometimes that has to do with the fact that, you know, many of us don't have the same access that uh, our white brothers and sisters have. So when we can't get, if we live in places like food deserts where there's no good grocery store for us to go to, that is problematic. Uh, also nutritionally, thinking about exercise or physically exercise, whatever things you can do to build yourself up to fight. Uh, when Chris Cuomo was talking about him having the virus, he was saying that you've got to fight with everything that you had. And that's not the first time that I heard that. I've read that in several articles that with people who that had this virus, they say, you've got to fight. Uh, it wants you to lay down. It wants you to concede. Uh, it takes your breath and you have to fight it mentally. This is a mental war right now. It's because we're fighting things that we, something that we don't know. We can't even see it and we don't even know who has it. And so that's, that, that plays a mental game on, on many of us. And what will help us in terms of building up our immunity is our community, right? Our relational um, relationships, our familial relationships, our friendships, and our spiritual relationships. Those are the things that are going to help us to fight the fear. Let's see. And the, uh, no, it's somebody else. And Gloria says, amen. So now the next question that we can ponder is how do we speak to the kids, your kids, forgive the typo there, 
your kids' fears and frustrations about this extended quarantine. Many, many people ask me that. And the reason why I put this in here is because I do think we have to have a courageous conversation with our kids. And I think it has to be uh, frequent and often. Um, the, if we're freaking out, then we, <laughs> we know that our kids are freaking out, thinking that they're stuck in the house. And, you know, I work with a lot of young people and it's really sad to hear them frustrated because they're seniors and they won't get a chance to graduate or go on their prom or, you know, go to the amusement park or the beach. Uh, this summer. They're not even sure if they've gotten into college, if they're actually going to have to go to college online in the fall. So the, it, it's worthy of a conversation with kids about how they deal with this. And especially the kids who may not think that this is a big deal, like the teenagers who want to, you know, go across town, let's say, to, to hang out with their boyfriend or their girlfriend or, or something. Kids need predictability, they need consistency, and they need structure. Quite frankly, adults need it as well, right? And that helps us all feel and helps our kids feel safety and security. So that increases our confidence. It levels up our confidence and that, that helps them in the midst of this, right? The thing about it is that, you know, this virus has caused many of us to feel insecure. We're insecure in so many different ways, but we've got to, you know, going back to that leadership, we've got to let our kids know that we're in charge, that, that, you know, you're going to, the, the household rules are gonna be slightly different because the adults are in charge to keep everybody safe, right? So you also have to have a conversation with your kids and let them know that you're gonna protect them, you're gonna provide for them, that you're also gonna be patient with them. So you might have to give yourself a time out from your kids if they're getting on your last nerve so that you're not you know, um, saying things you shouldn't say or blaming them for just being a kid. This is a difficult time for everyone. So. If you need to take a time out to be patient, let them know, listen, I, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed right now. You can say it in your own way, words, but take that time out and then come back. And then it's of course important to talk with your kids about their smart plan as well, because they should have one also. And is there somebody else? Mm -hmm. Oh, go out and come back in <laughs> and mom. Oh, trying to say go out and come back in mom. Yeah. Let's see. Yes, she said yes. Um, and then the other piece to that is when we're thinking about kids, open door policy. This is very, very essential. You cannot have kids wondering what's going on in their own heads and you're not saying anything, they're not saying anything. You really want them to trust you enough that, that you they can come to you when they're fearful, when they're upset, when they're anxious, uh, when they you know, they're just frustrated because they can't get out. They need to be able to come to you. So you need to let them know. You've got an open door policy that they can ask you anything. And parents, it really, really is important that you ask open-ended questions if they do come to you and let them share with you how they're feeling. Because otherwise, they may be trying to protect you or trying not to share as much because they don't know how you're going to take it. And so ask those open-ended questions. Ask them how their friends are doing, that's kind of a little bit of a side door way of getting them to talk about how they're feeling if you ask them, how are your friends doing with all of this? Have you talked to them? What's going on with them? And then they hopefully will open up about how they're experiencing this quarantine as well. And then have them weigh in on new norms, right? The new norms really shouldn't be, you're gonna set the initial goals of the rules of engagement for the household, but the reality of it is that they should have some way to weigh in. They really should. And if they don't, then they're going to feel like that the same thing that they've always felt that there's, um, uh, you know, everybody's telling them what to do and then have regular meetings and updates early and often. You should have had them already. But if you haven't, there's not too late. And then have the, a little bit of a progress chart. We, by, by, the, by the way, guys, we still need to be washing our hands. And I can tell you, I've, I've never washed my hands as much as I wash my hands. And then you have to wash them the long way, right? You know, the 20 minutes and sing happy birthday and you're washing them like a surgeon and all of that. So washing hands, social distancing, that's very, very hard for kids. Uh, my my uh, BFF, Melissa, she talked about taking her kids to a, a date like in the car and have so her, her children could actually see their friends because they can't really hang out. And I thought that was really, really sweet. She still honored social distancing, but her kids got to see her friends. So find ways 
to be creative in terms of that rules of engagement. Hey, April, thanks for joining. So next thing on the list, question, how do I feel? Uh, how do I deal with feeling like there is no escape from home life, which is now blended into work life to, to the, to the uh, COVID-19, right? Well, that's for parents that are working from home and everything is blending together. Everything is blending together. And I, I get it, I get it. Never before have we been here where people have to live in the same home 24 seven with, the, with the, their kids, with their partners, with the dogs, you know, with, the, with their parents, you know, no one was prepared for this. And so sometimes, and if they're working from home, I've seen a whole lot of people that have said that, you know, they're not getting a break because they're working simultaneously while they're homeschooling. They have a new appreciation for the teachers because they're having difficulty. But remember guys, pain turns into power when we appreciate the process. You know, it's all about attitude. Uh, Donna says so many of our older children Okay. Okay. Um, pain turns into power when we appreciate the process. Okay. And then we work together to create new schedules for everyone needed at revised when needed. So those new schedules that I had asked people to create like four months ago, if you created those schedules, okay, well now you've created them and you may have to revise them. You may have to tweak them. You may maybe find out if it's working or not. You know, that goes back to the family meeting that you're having with the kids. And then also identify workspaces in the house. How many of you have identified workspaces in the home? Meaning that the kids are working someplace, you're working someplace. Now, some of my clients, they've had a big enough home where everybody could have their own separate workspace. But sometimes if you're living in a two bedroom apartment, then everybody has to have their little, their little place. I've actually done, uh, a session with a client and she was in the closet because that was the only place it was the closet was big enough that she could do the session in there but that was the place now she doesn't do her homework she does it on the dining room table but she had the session there so everybody has to go with their um you know what figure out what that looks like and then again purging those spaces is essential yes okay so donna says so many of our older children that have their businesses are concerned that they will ever they um, they will ever start over. They no, I'm sorry are concerned how they will ever start over or if they may need uh, to rebrand themselves. Lots of young entrepreneurs have lost businesses that may not exist again. Um, I hear that a lot. That's very that's very very true, Donna. My scientists are acting up uh, and. What I'm saying to people is you got to hold out. This is where prayer is very, very important. Your spiritual connection, um, you know, adapting to change. Maybe that, that could be a blessing in disguise. Maybe not. You know, there's a lot of people that have bet, you know, bet on entrepreneurship and it's not going as well. But this is an opportunity for us to retool uh, and figure out what's the next step in our lives. And, you know, I think that many people, if they stick in there and they don't get too um, hopeless, if you will, they may find out that it works out for them. Uh, Autumn said, I never thought of, um, I would be teaching older adults the best hand watching practices during Bible study Zoom. <laughs> That's very true. Oh, my goodness. I learned how to wash my hands through, I think, Dr. Oz and Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and they were doing it on, because I'm not a surgeon, so they showed me how to do it, and I've been doing it ever since. It absolutely makes sense, but we we weren't, nobody was washing their hands for 20 minutes, I, I mean, 20 seconds or singing happy birthday when they were washing it before. Um, let's see, and then and Gloria says yes. Is anybody else? Okay, okay, all right. So be patient with the process. Uh, purging, and then share work time with others. That's really important, guys, in terms of sharing work time, because, you know, if you haven't shared your work times with the people in your household, then they may be, it might be playtime for them. It may be, you know, time for them to eat, 
So everybody kind of has to be on unison. Whereas before, when you would drop your kids off to school or you had kids in college or you were going to work, nobody had to kind of, you know, uh, synchronize, if you will, their schedules. Now you need to do that. Um, create your break times, of course. Get some fresh air. Please, please, please. When there's nice weather out, go get your vitamin D. You might take it as a, as a supplement, but get out there and get fresh air. Laugh, exhale, uh, have a defined end of the day. That's very important in terms of not bleeding into the work schedule. And then the grief. Hold on a second. Okay, question. Um, this, this section right here in terms of this presentation is very, very important. I know that we're going to do this more. We're going to create a whole webinar or um, masterclass around grief because it's just too big to, to throw it in here. But I'm going to do the best I can because the truth is, and I, I like to hear your feedback, guys, in terms of what's happening uh, in your communities. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people are losing their loved ones. Uh, a lot of people are sick. And grief is uh, enormous for many of us during this pandemic. And so I do believe that we don't talk enough about it. I don't think that we learn enough about it. And then I feel that oftentimes we are blindsided. So I wanted to talk about how do we identify and understand um, our own grief uh, and loss uh, within the process of this pandemic. So when I was, Doing some research, I realized that, and I, I knew this, but I didn't necessarily know all the terms. There's a lot of different types of grief. So I just want you all to sort of think about where you fall in this. If you've lost a loved one recently because of this uh, pandemic uh, or this, you know, because of COVID, or if you know someone is in the hospital or you have a friend of a friend, or if you haven't lost anyone, have you lost something within yourself? with regards to this, uh, this journey that we're all on. So there's multiple types of grief, and I'm just gonna go through them relatively quickly. There's normal grief. I don't really know what normal grief is, but uh, according to the researchers, there's normal grief, and they're identifying normal grief as you typically will lose a loved one, right? And then you'd have to begin to the grieving process. But then there's anticipatory grief, right? That's when the, this whole thing that we're going through we're anticipating loss. This is what happens when you're watching the news all the time and you're seeing the death rates go up and, you're into, and then they're saying that the peak is coming and all this information is causing everybody to be overwhelmed. And so that anticipatory grief can be really, really difficult as well. Um, Autumn says, I've been encouraging folks to, um, to be adaptable because things are changing and new information is being shared every day. Uh, I can't see the bottom part. Okay, I, for peace, adaptability creates the space, the, the space for peace. That's awesome, and and we have to like have some grace for for each other. Uh, complicated grief for God, guys. The complicated grief is when oftentimes you may have some comorbid uh, other uh, issues going on, other diagnoses, maybe depression, anxiety, uh, some other some other issues that either are brought on by the grief or you already had due to the grief. I heard somebody say, even in this talk, that the domestic violence rates have gone up. We knew that that was going to happen because people are in the home and you know the homes are sometimes like a tinderbox. And so there may be this complicated grief that is really hard to identify and hard to understand. And then there's chronic grief, meaning this grief doesn't go away. It just stays there. And it just, you know, it, it's hard to process. It's hard to understand. Uh, it can be very paralyzing uh, for, for many people. And then delayed grief is when you're grieving, but you don't even know you're grieving. It's delayed and it's kind of almost put on hold. And then you're sort of blindsided when you start feeling the emotions of it. Of course, distorted grief is when we're distorting what we're feeling. Maybe we're projecting onto someone else. We're blaming other people. Uh, we're just really not in a good space. And uh, Essie said, hello. Hey, no, that's not Essie from Essie. Uh -uh. But thank you for joining Essie. Same name, same name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then there's 
uh, well, hold on, hold on. Then there's prolonged grief when the grief just seems to last forever and people want you to just get over it and you haven't been able to do it. And so that grief is very, very hard. Uh, exaggerated grief where you have lots of exaggerated emotions related to that grief that many people don't understand. Unresolved grief, you can't resolve it. Now, these grief, the, the, the grief that I'm talking about, it doesn't have to be someone that's died actually. It can be other things which we'll get into. And then mask grief, when people are masking uh, what they're feeling uh, and they can't really fully understand it. Karen says, uh, getting relief in expressing my feelings um, from Carolyn Brock Blocker's uh, teachings. Awesome, awesome. Um, that is, it's great. Um, and hold on a second. I'm, I lost my page here. Disenfranchise, I go through these ne next two, disenfranchise, disenfranchise grief. I, I think I want to come back and unpack that a little bit more because a lot of black and brown people are dealing with a disenfranchised grief because many of them are dying from this disease and nobody's, not many people are talking about it or they didn't, they just started talking about it. So we're gonna pause right there. We're gonna take a station break for our sponsors and we'll be right back. Maybe we won't be right back. Can you keep going? When you want me to keep going? Are you sometimes feeling out of sync and you don't know why? Do you ever feel like you just need to talk with someone about your circumstances? Dr. RG has provided professional therapy to thousands of individuals, families, and couples just like you. No longer do you have to believe there is nothing you can do. Having a therapist and coach to help you process what you feel is what you need. Dr. RG is known for working with marriages and couples to develop the skills to have courageous conversation and incredible transformation in their lives. Schedule an appointment today. Call 215-789-6999. Dr. RG is healing families one relationship at a time and transforming relationships one courageous conversation at a time. All right, we are back and we're trying to finish up the conversation about grief. I didn't want to go through that with too quickly because that disenfranchised grief. And I know I, I wanted you guys to mention if you identify with any points of any one of these particular types of grief, right? Whether it's something you're going through now or whether you've gone through this type of grief. Disenfranchised grief is what many people are going through right now where they're feeling like no one's really paying attention, uh, that they, they've been, you know, they, they, they've been having loved ones die and they've not been able to bury them. They've not been able to go to the hospital to see them, uh, you know, and they're really feeling very much othered and disenfranchised. And then um, cumulative grief is when you have multiple things happening simultaneously. There's one grief after another grief after another grief. And it's a cumulative effect that can be really, really hard. And that's been happening too. I, I saw we've been seeing on the news where there have been multiple family members that have lost their lives in the same family because they all came down with the survivors together. That is cumulative grief and very, very, very difficult. And then secondary loss. Um, grief, which is that you have the loss of a loved one, perhaps, and then you have the loss of your finances, or you have the loss of your home, or you have the loss that is incurred by this, this virus because you're not well and you're not able to work. There's multiple things that go on with the secondary grief, but all of none of it feels good. And so there's the, how do you know when you're grieving? How do you know what that looks like? It can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be social. Um, it certainly can be religious in nature. Um, everyone typically knows the five stages, right? That you go and you're in denial or that you're extremely angry or there's some bargaining with the grief. We know that there's depression sometimes uh, and then you get to an acceptance. But then there's some other ones. There's this shock. You've seen this a lot where people are just literally shocked. They're like, what just happened? The bottom just fell um, from under them and they don't even know 
how to describe their, language, their, their emotions. They don't even have language for their emotions where they're just in disbelief. Sometimes they may even feel guilty. I don't know if you've experienced this before where you have a loved one and you didn't, you weren't able to say goodbye. Maybe you dropped them off at the hospital and you thought that they would be okay and you couldn't stay and now they're not here anymore. There's a lot of that going around and people need to be able to identify the symptoms in order for them to figure out what to do with those, those feelings. So what do I do? If, uh, you know, about someone else's grief or what do I do about my own grief? Well, you got to give yourself permission to feel, right? You all know I say all the time, in order to heal, you have to feel, but you cannot heal what you don't reveal. This is where therapists come in or a spiritual advisor or a confidant, maybe even your journal, but you have to give yourself permission to feel. You have to give the, the emotion language, right? You have to be able to label it in order to begin to to understand it. And then of course you've got to get support, right? Nobody can do this by themselves. There are times when you may want to be with yourself. I, I can remember, to be honest with you, when my mom passed away and uh, the holidays would roll around and I just wanted to crawl into a hole somewhere. I just wanted it to be over. So I didn't have to kind of put on a happy face, if you will, for everyone else. Because sometimes you may feel like other people want you to just get on with life. Um, so you do need to get support and maybe from an objective person, not somebody that's subjective that just kind of wants to see you better uh, and wants to see you back to your old self. And you may not ever get back to your old self. Uh, and then being patient with the grieving process. It looks different, guys, for everyone. And if you're impatient with it, you're going to, you know, end up in one of those stages and not be able to fully recover in a way that allows you to live your full life. And so being patient with this process, uh, remember I say that, that there's pain, uh, the pain can be turned into power if you appreciate the process. Well, this is a process when it comes to grief and it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. You know, I say to people strap up because you're gonna probably experience every emotion imaginable uh, during this process, especially if you're losing loved ones during, <clears throat> during this time of COVID. And then, in terms of how, what to do about your grief, you can simultaneously embrace life while you're grieving. A lot of people don't think that they can. Hey, Ruthann. Hi, Ruthann. Thanks for joining um, the, the um, webinar, the, uh, the math class, if you will. Um, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, so think about what that looks like if you're doing it in tandem. What does that look like if you are feeling badly, but you're still living life. Life will go on. You will still have to go, go to work or you still have to take care of your children. Um, one of the most recent examples I can think of that even before COVID-19 was Kobe Bryant passing away and his daughter and his wife, his lovely wife, having to deal with um, having three other children that she had to take care of. And so I still see her. Um, she's definitely, you can see the sadness in her, her eyes, but I also see the, the um, the, the beauty in her voice when she is laughing with her children. I think she posted a picture of her two babies on, on a resurrection Sunday. So it, there's a tandem process to this where you're actually embracing the life that you have because life is to be lived and simultaneously dealing with, uh, that grief. Um, president, uh, vice president O'Biden, uh, Biden says that, you know, he lost his daughter and his wife uh, prior to uh, Jill Biden, who he married. And he said that, you know, at some point you'll get to a place where uh, when you think about the person, the smile comes to your face before the tear comes to your eye. I thought that was a wonderful way of thinking about this process of grief and eventually what happens over, over time. And if someone you know is grieving, it's a similar kind of process. Give them the permission to feel. Don't make them feel uncomfortable because they're still sad. Don't make them feel uncomfortable because they don't want to, when we get back to normal, go to the, the family party or the get together. Um, or right now, don't make them feel bad because they don't want to join the, the, the Friday night, you know, online uh, cocktail hour, if you will. Uh, you know, help them to understand that it's okay to feel research support for them, whether it be grief therapy or teletherapy or clergy, working with 
a clergy member, um, maybe there's some Greek groups out there, research those for them and give them to them. That will be helpful for them because then they can figure out when they want to utilize those resources and they don't feel pressured. And then step three, don't try to rush them back to normal because that's not going to work. They're, norm, they're, they're going to experience even a greater new normal than many of us. And for us, we're all experiencing this new normal together in terms of grieving the life that we once knew. And many people have said they're longing to go back to the life we once knew without the mask, without the social distancing, going back to going to the movies and the restaurants and all those kinds of things. And we all do. But the reality of it is that we will get there if we're healthy. And if we're not, if we get sick and something should happen, we won't get there. So we've got to figure out how to, to sustain ourselves and be content along the way. Um, and the last thing I would say about helping someone through grief is that the ministry of presence, sometimes you don't have the words. You just don't. It's just to just be there and say, I'm here if you need me. And then also give them space if they need to, uh, you know, be by themselves. So can the continuation of stress, uh, um, can the continuation of stress, uh, uh, what is what is I'm trying to say? Huh? Um, is there stress due to pandemic? So, so in other words, and I, I, I was rushing with this, but um, is the, the stress that we experience, can that create more pain for families if it's stress? Now, y'all don't have to read all this, but I felt like this was really, really important because stress kills. And many of us are under an enormous amount of stress these days. And so what I want you all to know is that there, there's a huge feeling of despair and hopelessness around stressors that we had. And there's a health disparity around those stressors. And for many of us, there's an individual experience of stress that increases our hormone levels, the cortisol levels, the adrenaline levels that cause our immune systems to be compromised. And when that happens, that long-term activation of stress that can disrupt our body's process and increase the risk for there to be a, um, numerous health problems. So when you're thinking about these immune disorders, when you're thinking about people that are immunocompromised, when you're thinking about people, quite frankly, that have these pre-existing conditions, a lot of that has to do with stress. And now we're under more stress than we've ever been before. We're under stress because of race. We're under stress because of socioeconomic level. We're under stress because of perhaps our sexual orientation. You know, we're under stress because we've lost our loved ones, our normalcy, our, our identity, right? Um, we've lost hope in many cases or health and wellness, um, sometimes relationships. These are all losses that are related to stressors. We also have loss of safety and security and serenity. How many of you all have felt as if your peace has been interrupted by the daily updates of people dying or friends you know who are getting calls and saying that somebody that is, was in perfect health is no longer here? That's insecurity. So we're operating in a place of insecurity for many of us. Job security, finances, food, shelter, recreational activities, many of us can't get out, the loss of comfort. Our comfort zones have been compromised. And so what does that mean for us? We've got to work towards stress reduction. We've got to work towards asking for help, making ourselves a priority, putting that oxygen mask on first, making a decision to take action, whatever that looks like for you and your family. We gotta start making some small changes. Rome wasn't built in a day. We don't you know, make big changes overnight, although this has catapulted us into a whole new reality, but we gotta make some small changes to get to the big changes. We also have to focus on improving our communication with our relationships, right? Because if your relationships if you had communication issues before COVID, you're definitely gonna have some communication issues right now, right? And so ask yourself, okay, what am I so upset about? If you're having a conflict with your partner or with your kids, 
of course, doing that mindfulness and getting an accountability partner, seeking help through mental health and through telehealth. Question, how do I improve communication with my relationship when we're already so stressed? How do you do that? Here's some things that I want people to remember. I statements always helps as opposed to projection. When we say you did this or you don't understand, those are, if you give the person the laundry list of all the things that they don't do well, then they're going to defend against it, right? So we have to have I statements. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I am thinking. This is how I'm upset. Own your own stuff. Regular timeouts. Give yourself a timeout. That's going to help in terms of your communication skills if you're agitated because you're under the same roof. This is also a technique that I help people to think about. Start out with pause. Pause. That gives you a minute to step back and not react. Then breathe, reflect, identify the triggers, and then respond. Pause, breathe, reflect, identify triggers. The triggers are really key because you want to ask yourself, why am I so upset? What, what triggered me? Was it them or is it me? And if it's me, then they can't help me. I can only help myself to address those issues. And then, excuse me, respond differently. Change your tone. My pastor used to say, he said he had a sermon that said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. It was years ago and I always liked that because the reality of it is sometimes we do have to check ourselves in order to engage in better communication. Sometimes we have to readjust our expectations. Maybe people can't do what we think they should do or what we want them to do. And we have to kind of roll back um, our expectations and be connected with what they can do. We got to elevate our listening skills. Oftentimes, to be honest with you guys, we're, you know, busy kind of thinking of our retort or how our debate or how we're going to come back at the person, whether it's our kids or a family member. And the truth is, We've, we've got to level up our own listening skills. Speak with intent to foster clarity. Like try to understand where the other person is coming from. Even if you don't, try to understand. The hope is that they can understand you. Every message that's sent is not the same message that's received. And so sometimes we're receiving something completely different than what the person is saying. So try to have some clarity about that. Be curious, not curious. And then inject goodwill. Focus on the end game. What is the end game for you? Well, for me, this is a picture of the beach. Morgan and I love the beach. And in my mind, I know that this will come to an end. This too shall pass. We do have the victory. All we have to do is keep ourselves healthy, you know, do the social distancing, not social isolation, or emotional or psychological isolation, we can stay connected. And at some point there will be a vaccine, there will be a cure, there will be a way in which we can get back to or get forward to, because I don't think we're ever going back, but get forward to our lives uh, in a healthy way. So I look forward to the beach. What do you all look forward to? Have something as a goal to move forward to in the midst of all this chaos, and I guarantee you, we're gonna be stronger and better and wiser when this is all over, but we have to be here. Okay. Ruth Ann said, so do I. And I can't wait to get to the beach, Ruth Ann says. And I know Ruth Ann is in, the, uh, in, in uh, Florida as well. And so, yeah. We um, are looking all forward to getting to a healthy place post this pandemic. Well, uh, I don't know, Morgan, if there were additional questions. Uh, this is the time where it's going to be the Q&A. This is the sort of the end of the talk. Any questions, guys? So we're gonna, so I, I, I left, I wrapped in enough time for you guys to ask questions about what you're dealing with, what you're struggling with, uh, ask questions about your friends or your family uh, that are 
dealing with this quarantine, if you have teenagers or if you have young adults that want to get out and they can't, or teenagers that are home from school or uh, that, you know, are not going to graduate or they may not, you know, they may, it may be delayed or they're not going to go on their proms. This is very, that, those are losses too. There's losses too. Uh, Gail said, reportedly people are engaging in facing, um, in facing conflicts and the misunderstanding about their relationships. The new stage of loss, hope, uh, or meaning helps in the healing um, part of grief. I think the cognitive grief theoretical uh, perspective focuses on not letting go of the person, but keeping their memory images and internalize and, and to internalize. And then the last part I gave the person in, instead of letting go. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, Gail. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, Gail and I are both therapists. In fact, Gail was the first person that hired me out of college. <laughs> um, and so I appreciate that because I don't think I knew anything at that, at that point. But I, um, I, I think that the therapeutic intervention is a good thing for many of us who are grieving because the truth is that this process um, is going to be long term, not short term. And right now, we have to figure out how we help people help and help ourselves through this. So if nothing but to visually image, you know, create a visual imagery of what is it that where do you want to go? Where's the first place you want to go? That's that's why I put this picture of of the beach up because that's the first place I want to go when you know, when I want to be with people. Well, church really is the first place I want to go. Um, and get back to my church community. But also, I, I love the beach. It's very freeing. I love the water. And there are some people, actually, I think, that are still on beaches, which I don't quite understand. Uh, but I also think that we need to continue to just be thoughtful and kind and considerate uh, and not judgmental and try to engage people in coming on board with uh, these kind of social distancing that is going to help prevent the spread. Anybody else? struggling with anything or challenged with this whole quarantine and surviving it and thriving. Uh, Ruth Ann says, I don't grieve at the time when the person phase, uh, passes, but weeks afterwards I do. And people, I can't read the back the bottom. Part. Oh. Got you, Ruthann. You know, I'm a little bit like that too, Ruthann, uh, in terms of the grief process. I uh, tend to feel as though the role that I have in my family is to coordinate things and to um, orchestrate the, the funeral and all of the moving parts that have to be handled. And so sometimes I, um, I, I find myself having to manage a lot of that stuff and then grieving later on too. Um, Donna says, I'm concerned for so many that are drinking alcohol too much concerned how this pandemic may increase the substance and alcohol abuse. Well, that's true. That is happening. Um, people are in the home and people look for vices and they look for their escapes and that's going to be problematic. In fact, I think I'm going to be talking about that on CBS tomorrow in the, um, the evening news spot five or six. So just tune in for that. So we'll be talking about that. Um, Gloria, um, Gloria Jean says, uh, you're awesome. I see, a psychiatrist now and I have been um, and you have been a great help just listening to your soothing voice. Oh, that's so nice, Gloria. Thank you. Actually, I, I appreciate you saying that my voice is soothing because I don't think it's soothing at all. I think I'm, I'm very nasally uh, and it's kind of high pitched, if you will. But everybody has a different perspective on this, of themselves than, than other people. But thank you. I so appreciate this. This is this is what I believe that I am called and Morgan, my husband is called to do. And we work together as a great team. I, I cannot um, thank him enough for just being my ride or die. And, you know, always being there behind the scenes, um, being my greatest cheerleader. Um, I will tell you this masterclass would not have happened if it was just up to my skills because my technological skills are very lacking. Uh, and he's been um, just amazing in so many different ways, not just this part of our business, but just in in love and in crisis. You know, that's what we started out with is who who shows up 
Slack, the first, the first letter of Slack is show up. Who's showing up for you? And he's my person. He's, he showed up for me and I show up for him. We're at DKC and I just appreciate uh, him. And I just wanted everybody to know that, you know, he's, he's the guy. He's that guy, DKC. Yes, hey, babe. <laughs> So Ruthann said yes, and Gloria said call me, okay? <laughs> um, Ruthann said yes, she is very good at what she does. Thank you, Ruthann. Gail said Dr. R.G. Allen Wilson is the master cat. Master, master case was wonderful, and thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Gail. Karen said great job, Team Wilson. Yes, we are Team Wilson. Uh, thanks for the compliments. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. And one of our favorite couples, that is said, one of our favorite couples. Love you guys. We love you too. You know, you and you and your hubby are one of our favorite couples. I look forward to us all getting back together. Um, maybe we'll go to Aruba with y'all guys because I, <laughs> y'all go to Aruba a lot. You travel a lot. Um, Allison said, thank you so much, Dr. RG. This masterclass was awesome. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for working with us around the technological challenges that we had just a few of them because I couldn't see the things at the bottom or what have you but actually I think we did pretty good for it to be our first time uh, on this platform I think we did pretty good I think we did pretty good Gloria said thank you for um to my daughter China for bringing me to her oh I love to know that you all knew each other okay awesome and Ruth, Ruth, for China yeah yeah I didn't know that thank you so much China for for um bringing Gloria to me. Um, and Ruth Ann said, I'm going to, um, I enjoy going to church and miss everyone. Me too. Me too, Ruth Ann. Um, I did watch online, of course, but I definitely miss everyone. And China said, welcome, mom. <laughs> All this time, I did not know Gloria was your, um, with your mom, China. Oh, that's awesome. And Larissa says, uh, awesome show. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Um, Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so guys, one, thank you so much. I do not take it lightly that you have hung in there with me on a Thursday evening for two hours for this first masterclass, this inaugural masterclass on surviving COVID-19 uh, with Dr. RG. So I so appreciate it. Thank you, Envy. Envy said, you're amazing. Thank you, Envy. And you guys, let, let, let other people know this is what we're going to be doing. Um, go over to the Ask Dr. RG YouTube page, uh, A-S-K-D-R-A-R-G-I-E. Let other people know, just like China told her mom about me, let other people know we're going to be doing more master classes like this. We're going to be doing more, putting out more content. And our goal is to help people, right? Healing families one relationship at a time and transforming couples, individuals, and corporations one courageous conversation at a time. Y'all, if you, if you don't have the book, get it. You can get it at drrg.com. Uh, uh, drrgconnects.com, uh, and uh, we will still send them out to you. You can also go on Amazon and get it as well, but if you, you know, either way, you can get that, that book. Um, I think it's, a, it's very, very timely right now. And uh, again, I don't take this lightly. I, um, I love you guys. I thank you for hanging in with me on, on a Thursday night for our first masterclass. And there, this is the first one, but it will not be the last one. I love you guys. We're going to have another sponsorship break and we'll be right back. Hey guys, so uh, Ebony says, or, hi Dr. Archie, are you recording the, can you see that? Are you recording the, can you see the last part of that? Oh, okay. Yep. 
it'll be on YouTube page. So it, it it will live there, so you can um, you guys can see it, and you can point people to to there. So they point people to the YouTube page, and there's gonna be other things. Yes. 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 Gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, so we're gonna be really putting a lot more content on the YouTube page. It's the Ask Dr. R G uh, YouTube page. A S. K D R A R G I E. So if you guys can go over there and tell other people to go over to the YouTube page, um, subscribe there and hit the notification button. That way you'll know what other content that we're putting on there. We're going to be doing more master classes as well. And then we're going to be doing some short clips there. We're going to be doing some inspirational things. We're going to also put all of the content that I've been doing out there regarding COVID-19 and even some previous things on Chairman Hall and Mel Robbins and uh, the Today Show and some of the other local channels uh cnn so we'll put all of that on the youtube channel you can see those those appearances as well and our goal is to bring you not only good content but um good information that helps you to be in a healthier relationship both with yourself and with others and whether we're in COVID 19 and this too shall pass it absolutely will we're going to be better not bitter afterwards and when that happens we're all going to be um you know we're going to be moving in the right direction together we're going to use this to level up ourselves and our relationships. Um, Gail said, I love the style of the commercials too. Um, that music is great. That's all Morgan. <laughs> That's all Morgan and Daryl and Brent. And so we thank you. Thank you so much for everybody, everyone. All right. I think it's 901. So we are going to sign out again. And I always say, I appreciate you. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it and have a beautiful evening on purpose from my heart. Thank <laughs> you.